Good morning, folks. If you could mute yourself uh, upon, I'm going to make it so folks, here we go. Good morning, folks. We are here on this very chilly morning, ready to learn all about grains. We're just letting folks join uh, and we'll be with you in just a second. Okay, good morning, everyone. Settle in. So good to have so many of you here this morning. Um, we want to remind you that your conference registration allows you access to this seed conference, as well as the amazing 60 plus workshops hosted by the NOFA New York Winter Conference. There's such a broad range of topics and presenters to learn from. Both the seed conference and the winter conference are all in one program, which we are pasting into the chat. We are also pasting into the chat, uh, the community agreements, which frames the respectful and supportive atmosphere all attendees um, have a responsibility to help create while we're here. Give me just a second, you know, do this the right way. We're all a little slow this morning, so be patient with us. Some molasses level of uh, metabolism on a morning that's 20 below. Uh, next slide. Next slide. There we go. Uh, our huge thanks and appreciation to these Seed Conference and Winter Conference sponsors. Uh, their fiscal support represents their belief in the combined value of community, education, and sustainable agriculture. Next slide. The In Living Color uh, Black Indigenous People of Color Affinity Space. Uh, this is uh, all Black Indigenous People in Color conference attendees are invited to access the In Living Color space facilitated by Amanda David and Madonna Bushi. To access this space, contact them by email, which I'll be pasting into the chat. Okay, welcome folks to the Northeast uh, 2023 Northeast Community Seed Conference, which is entirely planned by volunteers and in a faithful partnership with NOFA New York. This is the fourth iteration of a Northeast focused seed event. Again, big love for NOFA New York for all they've done for us. Um, Northeast is defined as an area from Maryland through ascending US states crowned with Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Atlantic Canada. If you're joining us from beyond the Northeast, all are welcome. Don't worry. We're glad to have you. The seed conference intends to cultivate a respectful regional seed community that learns and grows together and supports each other through joy and hardship. Another way to be part of the regional seed community is to join the Organic Seed Commons, uh, which is an online kind of forum network. Um, and within the Organic Seed Commons, you'll find there's a various regional seed networks, including a Northeast uh, seed group, and we'd love to have you. Rather than, uh, we invite all present to use the Zoom chat to introduce themselves and to name the First Nation lands they occupy. To discover upon the lands that upon who you that you live upon, please use the link in the chat, which is a great uh, resource, and also on the slide, uh, nativeland.ca. Basically, this uh, amazing website will allow you to understand the indigenous communities, not just in the United States, but all over the world. So even if you're joining us from another country, you can find what folks are in, involved in own, land ownership or land stewardship in your area. Next slide. Rather than relegating plants to their Linnaean classification of family, we ask all present to consider the families of people that have been abundantly supported by plants through time. Everyone here and their loved ones simply do not exist without the gifts given by plants. First among those gifts are seeds. Without these seeds, we do not live. Every plant has an origin in a specific place near or far from here, and many have undergone journeys across the earth and back. Before planting, take a moment to ask yourself, 
What do I know of these lands and hands that have shaped and supported this plant? If I have purchased seeds, do I know where these seeds that I rely upon, that I rely upon have come from and who has grown them? What can I do going forward to respect this plant, those places, and those individuals, regardless of how near or how far away? Many of us think of seed as something we buy from a catalog rather than, than from cherished plants we harvest seed from ourselves. The buying of seeds from catalogs or online is relatively new as a reality. Please take a moment to imagine what it would look and feel like to share seed in a community rather than only through commerce. Well, you're joined today by our wonderful presenters, but also Lee Ullman, who is doing these uh, wonderful slide work and will be managing the chat and he's co-hosting and myself. My name is Heron Breen. Um, I live in central Maine and St. Albans and it's wicked cold here, as we like to say. Lee, where are you hailing from? I'm coming to you from the Hudson Valley. There we go, New York. And our presenters. Sylvia Davitz and Richard Roberts will be presenting in our first hour, and Benita Adib and Paul Lovelace will be presenting in our second hour. So I'd love to have our presenters give a brief introduction of them and you know, just where they're from, and each of you will get an opportunity to actually introduce yourselves more fully in your slides or in your presentations. We'll start with Sylvia. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Sylvia DeVotz, and I garden and save seeds and grains in Heartland, Vermont. Wonderful. Thank you, Sylvia. Richard, good morning. Oh, you're on mute, Richard. There we go. On mute? Yep, there you go. Hi, I'm Richard Roberts, and I live in Solon, Maine, and I'm on the board of the Maine Grain Alliance and I run their heritage seed restoration program. Thank you, Richard, for being with us. Benita, good morning. Thank you for joining good us morning. today. So good to see you. I, I am uh, Benita Adib, uh, president and one of the founders of Ujama Farming Cooperative Alliance and Ujama Seeds. I am uh, calling in from uh, Southern Maryland, uh, which is part of the uh, Maryland, Virginia, uh, D.C. region. Uh, and I am calling from unceded Piscataway Kanoi territory. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Now, last but not least, Paul Loveless, uh, say hello. Uh, certainly least, but... Uh... Happy to be here with, with all of you. I'm calling in from uh, Kentucky, um, native land to Cherokee, um, Shawnee, uh, Wyandotte, and, and many others, uh, known and unknown. Um, and I am uh, the founding director of Teach Outside. And I'm also a seed farmer with Ujama, uh, Cooperative Farming Alliance, and um, an excited partner and all things related to sorghum. Awesome. So yes, just to give a little broad overview of what we're doing this morning, um, Sylvia and Richard will be going first and sharing sort of an overview of some of grains that we might be familiar with and some that we don't. Uh, and P Benita and Paul will be spending the second hour talking very explicitly about sorghum and its diverse uses, which is pretty much infinite as we're going to discover. Um, so we're running ahead, but what that is great. And our goal here is that we're going to give uh, each of the each of our presenters are going to be presenting for 15 or 20 minutes. And then we're going to have some questions that will that have, you know, key questions for each of them. And at the end of the hour, hopefully we'll have some time for sort of like group questions for both presenters. So Sylvia, we've actually come to the time where it's your moment. And we'd love to have you uh, share with us your experiences with working with grain. Okay, this is pretty exciting. I am going to attempt to share my screen and I hope this is going to work. Uh, hang on a second. Okay. 
as Sylvia is presenting, feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll circle back to you. Okay, the, at the moment, the little, the bar at the top is obscuring my ability to choose slideshow. So let me see what- You should do. be able to move that bar. There we go. There's that. Okay, there we go. Looks can you great. Open that? Did that did that work? It worked. It looks great, and we can hear you. And wonderful. Thank you. So, um, just to give you a little bit more background on on who I am, um, I've been gardening for about forty years and saving seed for about thirty of those. And for the last fourteen years or so, I've been focusing on grains, uh, partly because uh, they're absolutely fascinating and because of their beauty and their intelligence. So I'm also on the board of the Northern Grain Growers Association. I'm a co-founder of the Upper Valley Seed Savers group. We've been meeting since 2006 monthly and um, also co-founder of the Heritage and Landrace Grain Network. And this is a view of my garden from the West. And what I'm hoping to do in this session is just give you a sense of the incredible range of grains that we can grow in our home gardens and that there's, uh, there's little mystery to growing them. They're actually fairly undemanding and easy to grow and that you can produce an impressive range of really beautiful and delicious foods with your harvest. And isn't that the ultimate goal anyway is to bring these things to our tables. So grains hold a particular fascination for me. They're nourishing staple food that connects us back through at least 10,000 years of agriculture. There's actually some archaeological evidence that uh, some of our ancestors were baking something, uh, something, some form of bread from really wild ancestors of wheat and barley as much as 14,000 years ago, which is quite amazing. So my personal focus is on heritage and land race varieties because of their diversity, their adaptability, their flavor, nutritional profiles, and because they have not been subjected to intentional breeding. They've been farmer selected and largely adapted to the region that they emerged in. So some of the grains that I grow are wheat, barley, oats, rye, emmer, spelt, einkorn, upland rice, corn, and the pseudo grains, millet and sorghum. So why is the home garden ideal for growing small plots of grains? First of all, you have the ability to trial many varieties of several different species at the same time, since most grains with the exception of rye are largely self-pollinating. You can alternate them in the row, which is something that you see here in this slide, uh, just to avoid any kind of unwanted pollination. Um, so here you see barley, oats, wheat, emmer, and spelt happily, co happily coexisting. You can observe characteristics and personalities closely over the whole season or even over several years, identifying noteworthy traits among different varieties. And this will allow you to select for the best qualities and trial promising varieties under different conditions. And something that you see in the foreground here is this one variety of grains is, is doing what's called lodging, which means that it's falling over. This is sometimes a consequence of too much fertility in the soil, but sometimes it's also uh, variety specific. So it's something that you might want to select um, against. Uh, so another aspect of all of this is that even small plots and mine are actually rarely more than three feet by five feet will yield a significant amount of seed. You're gonna have plenty of seed for sharing and also for food, as you will see later. You can actually start with even a very small quantity of seed, but on average, one head of wheat has about 50 seeds. So you can actually increase your seed very quickly. And especially if the variety that you're growing tillers heavily, which means that a lot of different branches coming up at the same time. And so again, what this means is that within even just a couple of years, you're gonna have plenty of seed to pass on perhaps to a farmer in your region who will be able to grow a larger quantity and help bring this back into cultivation. 
And finally, and what's very important is that you're gonna to contribute to preserving rare varieties to support their diversity and to prevent their extinction. So um, where to source seed? Look for varieties that originate in areas that have a similar climate and latitude to yours. Look for ones with which you have a cultural or historical connection. Request seeds from seed savers whose practices you trust, and this is very important. And here you see the cover of the Seed Savers Exchange uh, yearbook, and there's also an online exchange. And this is uh, actually a, a really good source of, um, of seeds. Uh, but one of the things that I've been most aware of in very recently is that there's actually an inverse relationship between the growing interest in heritage grains and the availability of seed. So even some of the, the sources that I originally obtained seed from don't even exist anymore. So in order to find seed, you might have to simply sniff out some of the individuals who have, still have important collections. So how to grow grains, very simply. Um, grains are basically really undemanding. They're really easy to grow. They want moderately fertile soil. They want sufficient irrigation while they're growing and then dry conditions when the seed is ripening. Ideally, sow the seeds about eight inches apart in rows that are eight inches apart, mulch with hay to keep weeds down. And essentially there are two main types of grains. There are the spring planted grains, which is what you see here, which in our area go into the ground before April 15th. And then there are the fall planted grains, which grow, go into the ground before September 15th in our region. So this slide shows you what they will look like in the following spring. And what you can see is a little corner of the bed that shows the spring planted grains up in the left-hand corner of this slide. So I grow mostly fall planted grains and for a number of reasons. I find that the most interesting varieties are fall plant planted. They cut down on spring work. They grow thickly to shade out weeds and they have very strong growth habits. So how to save seeds um, from grains. This is actually also not all that mysterious. There are four stages of ripeness in grain seeds, milk stage, soft dough, hard dough, and flint. Ideally, you wanna leave the grains in the bed until they're fully ripe and both the seeds and the stems are this wonderful golden color. Harvest if you can at the hard dough stage, which is when a thumbnail pressed into the grain uh, meets with some resistance and there's no longer a milky substance exuded by the grain. So harvest at the hard dough stage, sometimes the stems will still be green when, uh, this, when the grain is actually ready for harvest, as you can see in this slide. But the main thing to pay attention to is that the grain itself needs to be fully developed and just need to continue to dry down. I harvest entirely by hand and that's partly because that's possible because my plots are very small. Sometimes an entire planting will ripen all at the same time and sometimes ripening is staggered. If that's the case, I keep the first heads to ripen separate, hoping to select for earliness. The, uh, the stems all get bundled into sheaves uh, you, and you wanna be sure that you label them with the variety name and the date of harvest so that you can remember this later and, and keep it for your records. So these grains are drying down in my greenhouse and which is what's important here is that this is a mouse free environment and they're just gonna dry down until I have time to um, do the threshing. Uh, almost all of the grains that I grow are what's called hullless, which means that they, at threshing time, the grains will separate really easily from the hull and from any plant material. So what I'd love to do now is run through some of my favorite varieties that I grow, just once again to show you the um, absolutely amazing diversity and beauty that's expressed in some of these grains. This is barley excelsior purple. The original seed that I received of this variety was tan in color 
And over the years of growing it, the color has migrated toward purple. It's a phenomenon I don't fully understand. It may have to do with a recessive trait that is uh, increasingly expressed. Um, but in any case, I keep these seeds separate and continue to harvest for and select for purple uh, over the years. This is a, another hullless barley, Zwergeist, which basically means dwarf barley. It's a variety that I received from the Swiss uh, seed saving nonprofit. It's very short in stature. So there's, and it has very sturdy stems. So there's never any possibility of lodging. Uh, and I think it's what's called a square head, very dense and compact heads, beautiful little variety. This is a, uh, an heirloom flint corn from the Italian speaking part of Southern Switzerland. Roter Tessiner mice basically just means red corn from the Ticino. Um, it's beautiful flint, makes absolutely gorgeous and very flavorful polenta. Emmer, uh, it's also a variety that I received from the Swiss seed savers. <clears throat> Emmer is sort of a, it's an ancient grain. It's a cousin of spelt. It's a hulled grain, which means that the hulls are, are tightly held around the grains. And the slight disadvantage of this is that you'll need special equipment for threshing. The advantage is that hulled varieties tend to be a little bit more disease resistant and resist, resistant to pressure from birds and, and other critters. But in any case, again, pretty, pretty gorgeous. This is a foxtail millet that I grow. It's a Chinese variety, super productive, really gorgeous and relatively low in stature, which is also an advantage for, for harvesting. A hull, <clears throat> excuse me, a hullless oat variety called Shelley. It was introduced by Tim Peters and he named it after his wife, which is pretty sweet. I grow a lot of upland rice uh, experimentally because I think we should be growing rice in Vermont. This is an absolutely gorgeous land race Japanese variety. It's exceptionally cold hardy as is indicated by the name. Mizu means water, kuchi means mouth, and ine means rice. And so it was grown at the point in the paddy where cool water entered in. So which means that an especially cold hardy variety was, was required for that uh, location. This is a perennial rye variety. It was also introduced by Tim Peters. My bed is probably about five years old now and continues to produce seed year after year. Sorghum, this is a combination broom and grain sorghum, dwarf mayo. Um, again, the advantage is that it's only about four and a half feet tall. A lot of sorghums, as you'll probably hear about later, is our, uh, as much as 12 feet tall, which makes it very challenging to test for seed ripeness and, uh, and to harvest. Really beautiful combination broom and, and grain. This is another Swiss land race variety. It uh, comes from around Lucerne in Switzerland. It was included in UVM's spell trials a few years ago. We grew out enough there to pass on seed <clears throat> to a Vermont grower, a farmer who grew out a larger field of it. We were then able to include it in bake trials last summer with really excellent results. So that's incredibly exciting because it's again, the potential to bring some of these really old wonderful varieties back into cultivation. I wanna show you some spring wheats now. This is Chitam Blanc de Mals. It's a very old variety. And although the name is French, it was probably originally an English variety. And the name is likely a corruption of the name of a village in Sussex. Hurani is one of the oldest of the Durham wheats. It hails from the Beka Valley in Jordan. Durhams normally need a hot, dry climate. So growing them in the Northeast is a real challenge. But we want to make paste pasta from our locally grown grain, don't we? So I've been growing this for a number of years and every year I'm selecting for the heads that show the least amount of disease. And so it's, it's been improving uh, noticeably over the years, which is uh, really exciting. Sinskaya is a very ancient wheat. It's a relative of einkorn 
However, it emerged from a cross of different wild grasses and is much more easily threshed than einkorn. So that's a, uh, an interesting and valuable characteristic. I wanna show you a few winter wheats now. Black einkorn is actually what's called facultative, which means that it could be planted either in the spring or in the fall. I grew it as a fall grain a year or so ago with absolutely stunning results that you can see here. It was uniform in height, uniform in um, days to maturity. The heads were gorgeous and well-formed. And so I will continue to grow it as a fall grain. Breisgauer Briganto Hotel Land is a land race from Germany. Uh, what's exciting about this grain is I grew it first in a year where we had a, a, just a super abundance of rain and it did extremely well. The following year, we had almost drought conditions and it did very well there too. So this speaks to the adaptability of a lot of these grains and traits and characteristics we really want to be observing and uh, selecting for. Ethiopian purple is the only purple seeded wheat that I grow. This one is relatively tall, but it's extremely, you can see that it has very sturdy looking stems. So it's extremely lodge resistant and disease resistant. Uh, and of course, really beautiful. Candor 2262 is another Durham. It was given to me by a breeder in Kansas who's been breeding uh, some winter uh, hardy uh, Durham wheats. And again, it's a variety that shows a lot of promise for growing in Vermont and in the Northeast. Rouge de Cos originated, it, basically the name means red of Scotland. It's an exceptionally cold hardy variety and it is reputed to have really excellent baking qualities. And I'm hoping at some point to grow out enough of it to actually trial it uh, for baking for bread. Tuzel Anon is one of the oldest of French varieties. It, uh, it is actually believed to have been grown in Provence in Roman times. So it's a fantastic historical connection there. And there is actually a farmer up in Quebec who has been growing it out and using it. So it is beginning to come back into cultivation. Vermont reed is a club wheat, which means it's a soft white. It was developed by Vermont breeder Cyrus Pringle. And soft whites have a much lower protein content. So they are particularly suitable for uh, cakes and pastries rather than for bread. So one of the beauties of growing many different varieties is that you can actually conduct taste tests and discover all the subtle differences of flavor, texture, and cooking times among the different varieties. This is a barley variety taste trial that I did. So each of these varieties was cooked separately and then tasted and um, uh, observed and appreciated. I did a corn variety taste trials as well, several different varieties. This is a, a rice variety taste trial. What you see in the upper right hand corner, that dark grain there is a a very old Japanese land race variety of rice called purple joman. It is extremely fragrant, very perfumey, and it has a much quicker cooking time than some of the other varieties. So again, observing all of these differences among the different varieties is eye-opening and um, palate pleasing in many ways. So um, of course, cooking and eating whole grains is delicious and nutritious, but if you want to process your home grains further, you need little more than this hand cranked Corona mill, which will produce everything from coarse polenta to very fine flour. And of course, one of the beauties of it is it works really well during power outages. What I'd like to show you now is some of the really wonderful grain, dishes that you can pre prepare with your homegrown grains. And once again, the ultimate objective of growing the grains is to uh, bring them to our tables and, and taste their wonderful flavors. This is a salad made with Ethiopian barley. There's some feta cheese in there, um, scallions, parsley, and a little glass of uh, 
Vermont hard cider up in the upper left hand corner. This is cornbread made with the rotor to scener mize that you saw in one of the early slides. It has beautiful red speckles throughout from the, um, from the seed coat. Pancakes make, made with lucky stripe dent corn. And the important thing to remember here is that sorghum also makes fantastic pancakes. It has a lot of different culinary uses. Sourdough English muffins that were made with homegrown spring wheat. And here we have some pasta made with the Hurani durum that you saw earlier. And uh, I like to add some Canada crookneck squash to the pasta. It adds a little bit of extra color and a little extra flavor. This is a casserole made with um, winter squash, a lot of different mixed grains and hazelnuts. Unfortunately, we had eaten half of it before I remembered that I wanted a picture of it. But um, the other thing that's, that's remarkable about all of this is that this dish is made with all with ingredients that can be grown by us regionally, which is another thing we really want to focus on for a complete local food system. And then five grain hot cereal, absolutely perfect on a cold morning like this. All of these grains were grown locally in my garden. And finally, of course, bread. And this I was able to make with about 50% of homegrown wheat. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope I've inspired you to grow as many grains as possible in your garden. Start small, start with what you like to eat, experiment wildly and share the seeds. Thank you very much. Before you stop uh, sharing, um, Sylvia, yes. folks wanted, could you scroll backwards to the mill that you use? And I, there, Megan may have some questions or other folks may have some questions. Did you say to the mill, the Corona mill? Yeah, the, uh, the, yes. yeah, the Corona mill, yep. Yes. Does anyone have any questions about that? Um, Megan, if you want to come off, I see our attachments available to connect to a KitchenAid mixer to process grains. This is another question from somebody. Is there a KitchenAid version of? Not sure. Well, uh, I think the question of processing grains that what you're actually seeing in this slide is that there is an online sort of guide to adapting the Corona mill to dehulling rice. And I did an experiment one, one year and I replaced each of the wheels with a, um, a disc of a natural rubber. Um, it did not actually work really, really well. So I think the, the question of dehulling rice in, in the home is one that's still open. I think there's some small scale Chinese dehullers that are available. I have not yet found um, a great solution to doing that. I would not try to thresh grains with the mill. Uh, I do threshing with a little sort of a frame that I've built that has screen in the bottom. Um, and I just shuffle the grains with my feet in that to, to thresh the grains. But um, yeah, I'm not sure about the KitchenAid. I'm not entirely confident that that would do a good job. Mm -hmm. And we have another question about wondering how much space one would need to produce two to four pounds of grain. You know, this is a question that there's a lot of controversy around. Of course, it depends on what variety you're growing because there's a huge range in the productivity among the different varieties. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Jean Logston, and I think it's, some, it's called something like Small Grain cultivation, hang on, I've actually got it in the bookcase here. Um, small scale grain raising is what it's called. And he has a wonderful chart on one of the pages in the book that will give you some kind of a sense of what, what yield you can expect from what size plot. So I would, I would refer to that, but, but definitely remember that um, production productivity is gonna vary enormously among the different grains that you grow. So there's not one absolutely reliable formula. Richard puts in the chat that the mock mill is an attachment for the KitchenAid. 
Um, and Richard will be presenting next, and so maybe can speak a little bit more to that. Uh, Chris McHugh asks, do you have do you do anything special to the seeds before planting, such as soaking, inoculating, or any other tricks for healthier growing? I do not do anything at all, and I think I'm not sure that there are techniques that will necessarily enhance germination. Uh, one of the things to remember about seed saving in general is that if you are growing and saving your own seed, just the quality of that seed is going to be far superior than most just about anything that you can purchase. Uh, so germination rate is going to be better. Vitality, vigor, longevity, all of those things are going to be uh, infinitely better than uh, most seeds that you can purchase. One last question before we move forward to Richard. Uh, Rebecca asks, um, I only have access to a community garden to which I, I only get access to in late May. Do you have suggestions for grains that work well in which circumstances, in those types of circumstances? Um, so I, I was just sort of thinking to myself, maybe a winter would be better because it probably will be fine taking care of itself to get there in May. But what are your thoughts? Um, I, I, Sylvia. Yeah, I agree completely. I would try to focus on fall planted grains in that case. Uh, I think if you plant too late in the season, and May sounds really late, then you definitely just risk that the, the grain is not going to mature properly within the season that's available. So focusing on fall grains is, is probably what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul puts in the chat, consider sorghum for late May or obviously corn is also an option. Exactly. Um, well, Sylvia, thank you so much. And of course, folks, if you have more questions for Sylvia, please put them in the chat um, and we'll come back after Richard's presentation. Maybe we'll have time for everybody. Um, and if you could stop sharing your screen, um, Sylvia, we can switch over to Richard and thank you. Richard, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us. You're, you're muted. At the yeah, moment, I just unmuted myself. There you go. Okay. Would love to hear what you have to share, Richard. Feel free to take it away. Okay. I'll start sharing my screen. Oh. Okay. So uh, my name is Richard Roberts, and I am on the board of the Maine Grain Alliance. And as uh, probably a lot of you know, the Maine Grain Alliance is known primarily for the kneading conference. So that has been around uh, since um, this, this will be its 16th year. Uh, it started primarily as a number of uh, bread bakers and oven, oven builders in Skowhegan, Maine. And then... Um, they had that for years, and then 2013, they decided to try to find, um, see if they could find some more um, other types of grains than the few that they had uh, to grow out. And so that's when we collected a number of different varieties of grain from seed savers and started growing them. And I was involved in that project from its beginning. And then um, when the woman who was in charge of it left, I, I took it over. So we've been doing this uh, for, it'll be 10 years this year. So the, um, let's see if I can click on, there we go. So um, here's a little plot that we have in front of Maine Wood Heat in Skowhegan, which is a, uh, uh, it's like a demonstration plot and Maine Wood Heat builds those big wood fired domed ovens. And so they've made their front yard available to us. And we really have it just as a way of uh, uh, demonstrating to people it's on a pretty busy road, all the different varieties that uh, are possible to grow. And uh, here's one that we here harvested right here was some cerventa. And cerventa is a variety of wheat that um, is from Lithuania. It came over to Will Bonsell, who was a seed saver here in, uh, uh, in Maine. And he uh, gave us 14 pounds of it. He'd been, he got it in 1998. So in 2013, so it had already been here, you know, uh, 14 years or so, 15 years. And uh, we grew out for three or four years and then made 900 pounds of it available to a farmer in uh, Northern Somerset County. And now that's probably the largest amount of Cerventa grown in the Western Hemisphere. 
Uh, that's the really the goal of the Maine Grain Alliance is to make grains of commercial grow grains out in quantity that would become a commercially available that the we would then give to farmers. Often what I've done is um, I might have, let's say, 100 pounds of, of some grain or something, and I would give it to someone, then I would ask for 300 pounds of it back, and then they could do whatever they wanted to with whatever they had, and then we could give that amount out more to other people. So here's uh, some of the plots that we have. Uh, that's like uh, Sylvia, uh, we're the next step after Sylvia. And so we have gotten a number of, uh, in the last couple of years, a number of varieties from Sylvia, very small amounts that uh, I started out as uh, four to six foot plots. And then last year I had some that were uh, 30 by 30. And this year I've got some that are probably 30 by 100. So um, of those same varieties. But this is what, you know, how these, how we do these, I grow them out. Uh, well, we'll go along as we see it. And then I'll, I'll under sow a lot of these with um, white clover, because I think that helps really to suppress weeds. And, uh, you, you know, because it's so hard to get in to try to do any cultivation in any of these things. Here's some larger plots that we've done. These are obviously, some of them are planted um, on a, um, you know, by hand, and some of them we have a, a seed drill, and I'll show you that in a second too. Here they are growing out. This is in front of my house. Other varieties, you can see there's the clover growing underneath them where we've got, uh, you know, to help keep the weeds down. Here are some that you know we've uh, harvested by hand, and then are getting ready to thresh them. These were probably, uh, you know, uh, that's a lot of what I do is on the smaller plots. I uh, grow them out, I, and then I harvest them with a little hand sickle, and then bundle them up and keep them all separated this way. Here is a machine that we, uh, the Grain Alliance, owns. And this is a, uh, a Chinese built rice paddy combine. And we found it works very well with, uh, with these grains. The grain head, as you can see on the end, that whole head uh, lifts up in the air. So the machine is really made just to take the heads off the grain. It can't really process the straw. There's a lower sickle bar where the straw is then cut down. And as you can see, the bag there in the center, I can harvest one bag at a time. Basically, that real barrel above the bag is just like the uh, the like a, a bagless vacuum cleaner. So the grain comes through, the chaff is all blown off, and the grain falls down into the bag. And then when each bag is full, then I have to stop and you know load it into something else. I often use those large uh, paper uh, leaf bags that you can get at the grocery store. Here is a small thresher that uh, that we own. Uh, I think we're har actually harvesting some of the grain that we got from Sylvia here last year, some of the plots. Uh, some of them, like I said, were as large as um, 30 by 40, and some of them were smaller depending on how well the original uh, varieties we got from Sylvia uh, performed. One of the things about uh, growing them out in the way we're doing is, as when you get to different size levels, so much can vary just on how um, the quality of the of the soil that you're growing it on. If you're doing it on a real small of plots, like four by six feet or something, you know, you know that's really garden size. But once you get larger out, then you know, depending on where you are in the field, uh, some the varieties might do better than others. You know, as anybody as any large gardener knows. Here is a, another, which is, this is a plot thresher. So it was probably, this is probably built in the 60s. This company that built, still continues to build these things to these this day, and they're probably sold to universities for uh, research purposes. And we were able to get this one. It's nice because you could just haul it around with the pickup truck and, um, you, as as a big a arm load of grain that you can feed into it, it will thresh, and it just comes. Uh, 
And that's the whole stalk and everything seed comes out of that. Here is a seed cleaner. It's a uh, it's from a clipper company and it would be an office size. Uh, so, you know, these things can be pretty expensive because this was like purpose built, but that's what we first started out. And I cleaned the 900 pounds of Cerventa on this, you know, like one quart at a time. So it, it took quite a while. Uh, larger seed cleaners will do it a lot faster, but these things are wonderful for these small uh, plot varieties because I'll do this and then I, uh, on a big four by eight sheet of plywood, and then I'm able to gather and collect like every seed that I get from the thing, which is when you're, when you're first getting going, that's the important thing is to be able to save as many of them as you can. Once you start getting into any kind of machinery, you know, you're bound to have uh, losses just because the machine can't harvest it as well as you can by hand. I had another slide in here which the computer uh, refused to accept. And it was uh, a picture of me with a hand sickle harvesting some of this. Uh, I don't know why the computer didn't like it and it wouldn't accept it. But if that's what I have done most of my small plots with, anything like uh, you know 30 by 30 feet, I usually do that by hand so I can, because at that stage of the process or the, the grow out, I'm trying, still trying to save every single bit. Now, in, in the ones I've got this year, that some that are 30 feet by 100 feet, I'll use that machine. And I know I'm gonna be losing some of the grain, although you know, I will go out afterwards and glean as much as I can from the fields and collect it all and separate, keep it all separate that way. Uh, if you do get a, a hand sickle, uh, I found one at a farmer's market that was the edge was serrated as opposed to just the sharp blade on the curve. And I love the serrated one more than I do the sharp one. It just seems to tear through the stalks a lot better. And, um, uh, and I, I suppose there's less danger of cutting your knuckles too. Here's a larger machine we uh, bought a couple of years ago. Uh, and this one, see, you can just dump a five gallon bucket of grain in at a time. Uh, this is some grain we were growing at, um, the KVCC campus, the Kennebec Valley Community College campus in uh, Hinkley, that's right on 201 between Waterville and Skowhegan. And we're doing some cleaning right there because there was uh, uh, so much uh, weed seed in there that we had to clean, thor really thoroughly clean it before we can even do a secondary cleaning, you know, to dry it out. Uh, the weed seed was, that's one of the things about, uh, as you all know, with organic gardening is uh, dealing with weed pressure, especially when you got on any scale. And, um, and it's, it, it, you can't really cultivate uh, wheat the way you can like a row crop like beans or anything because they're so close together. Uh, here is a, um, uh, this is, this is some, someone gave to us and I'm gonna have to do a little bit of repair on it, but it's all seemed to be there. This is a seed cleaner. They're also called fanning mills. Uh, you can pick them up. Sometimes you'll see them advertised on um, a Craigslist or something, and, and they're referred to as threshers, but they're not really a thresher because uh, uh, what they're for really is just to, to, seed, uh, to clean the seed afterwards. And they have uh, screens with holes in them that sit inside there and you hand crank it and they rattle back and forth. And there's a big fan fan blades, as you can see there right behind the behind the crank handle that blow the uh, chaff off. Or if you're doing beans or something, you know, would uh, do, get rid of the pods. Probably every farmer, every other farmer, a group of farmers would have one of these, you know, to clean, clean their grain with or, and their beans and everything else. Uh, this one, um, uh, like I said, was given to us. I have a smaller one that is really belt driven that I picked up, uh, that I saw sticking out of a, a barn that was getting ready to fall apart and we got it down and I've used that and cleaned hundreds of pounds of beans with it. You can get all these different screens for these things. Uh, there's a company called Quality Screens in Minnesota and they'll just make up screens for whatever size you need, punched uh, you know, with the holes for whatever uh, grain you're using. And here is a, uh, this is a 
a solar dryer that we have that we use to clean grain with, uh, I mean, to dry it with. So it's got a big fan on one end of it and it just uh, sits out in the sun and blows hot air through it. And we've cleaned lots of wheat and we've also cleaned lots of uh, flint corn with it as, I mean, dried flint, flint corn with it as well. So not only does the uh, Main Grain Alliance have a, our project works uh, primarily with uh, wheat because we were basically a bread focused group, but we also have a, a corn program that Albie Barden runs and he's, uh, He's really into the flint corn. Uh, I really like wheats and grains of that way, that kind. We have about 30 different varieties right now that we're growing out. Everything from just small plots that might be uh, 10 by 12 up to, um, I've got a couple of different um, winter wheats that we're growing out that we have an acre of each of those growing. So then this coming year, we should be able to uh, make a lot of that available to farmers, hopefully, that this has been kind of a rough uh, winter early on in the season with that freeze and thaw cycles that we've had. Uh, you know, I, I worry about it, but um, we've got snow on it now, so I'm uh, all we can do is hope for the spring. And then um, nonprofits in the area and other farmers have made land available to us because uh, you know we don't own the as a nonprofit uh, we don't own any land ourselves and so we're just uh, people make land available to us some of the farmers have plowed it and tilled it themselves others have uh, like some of the nonprofits have made land available and then we've had to uh, you know raise enough money to hire um, someone to come and do the tractor work on it and then we've also, uh, one of the things that we've spent most of our funds on to grow these things out has just been for amendments uh, for the soil, you know, buying lime for something to put on places that haven't really, old hay fields that haven't had anything grown on them for a while. I think that's the last one. I'm gonna go back. I think I had something here that I wanted to show you. Let me see if I can go back a ways. Oh, I got back out of my slideshow. Richard, we have a couple questions that maybe yeah. maybe your slides might help with. Um, yeah, there's one I question. had one here I wanted to show people. Go ahead. There's yep. that. Yeah, I've I've lost a couple. We have a. Um, I'm just going to go back out of this. If I can figure out how to do that. Oh, did I, no, do it? did I lose you? No, I'm still there, no, aren't I? No, we're all still here. Okay. Um, we uh, what one of the things I've done for small uh, for small plots is I've taken two earthway cedars and bolted them together uh, so that I can I can plant two rows at a time of the grain, and then I will take a, one of the the wheels that go inside them and actually use a uh, duct tape and tape over every other hole. So I'm not putting the, uh, the grain out as close together. Uh, ideally, as Sylvia said on when she was talking about it, and then I've also heard from Ellie Ragosa, who was a seed saver and who we've gotten a number of varieties from. Uh, if you can give these wheats enough space, they will tiller out more. You know, so out of just one seed, you might, instead of just getting one stem or two stems, you might get a half a dozen or more stems that you would get heads off of. Uh, so, you know, on the small, but once you start getting larger, I found that it's uh, really hard to plant, um, you know, like a 20 by 30 foot plot uh, by hand, putting a seed in every eight inches. So that's why I've gone to the uh, earthway cedars and, and just taping over some of the holes. And, and now I've bolted two of them together. The Grain Alliance also owns a, a seed drill, which is a small one that can go, that just does six rows. So you've got six rows that are eight inches apart. And, and that's what I've done to plant the larger plots, you know, um, uh, like the acre size plots. So at, any, was that helpful? Was there any questions on that? Oh yeah, well, there's definitely some questions. I'm going to walk through them one at a time. Okay. Um, 
Rebecca was really impressed with the Stukes. Can you talk about that? Those that you were making and like how that how that how you make those? Oh, okay. Well, I would just uh, as I would cut them by hand. I would just get until I knew I had a good size, and I would just actually kneel down around them and hold them, and then tie them with string. Or as you saw with uh, some of those there, I was just using um, masking tape, and th that I could write the names on each one of them. The nice thing about those is that when you get them, then you can stand them up and and uh, make sure that everything gets dry. Uh, I think one of the I've heard people say that that's one of the problems with the combine is that um, when they went to uh, comp, you know, start harvesting on huge, huge plots that uh, you were you were getting grain, some that was fully ripe and some that wasn't completely ripe before they would just have a, uh, uh, a reaper binder. So they would come and cut it and the binder would then bind it up into, you know, stooks or sheaves and then dump it out the side. And then they would just stand up and dry in the fields and how before long, you got a chance to fresh them. And how long do they stay in the field? And, and of course, this is by variety. I'm sure there's differences. But in general, how long do they after dry in the stooks? Well, if I, if I were to be growing something on, on like a garden scale for myself, uh, I found that a 16 by 25 foot plot Grow, planted with a uh, like a an earthway cedar, I could usually get about maybe ten pounds of grain out of that plot. So then you could that's still small enough that you could take those stooks, those sheaves, and either you know dry them in a greenhouse or stand them up somewhere and be able to take them inside if it started to rain. Put them in your garage or hang them up like Sylvia does. Um, uh, nowadays, of course, we have uh, moisture meters, so I can check the grain, you know, and just see how much moisture there is in them. I, I want to try to get it, uh, if I'm going to be storing something, especially the, the spring grains that I want to store until the next year to plant, I want to get that the moisture level down just as low as I can. So, for example, if I have a, uh, I might have had four or five or six of those big sheaves or stooks of grain, so I might have 10 or 12 pounds of, of grain. Uh, uh, I can, I can, I have a moisture meter so I can test for to see what, you know, how dry it is. But otherwise I would just probably, what I do is I'll lay it out on a tarp in the ground in the sun and just, uh, you know, with a, like some kind of a, a leaf rake or something, just rake it over in the sun and just help get it as dry as I can. Of course, Dryness is uh, you want it to be as dry as you can, and uh, the other thing is to have it be as cool as you can. So if you if there's a I have a whole chart that shows you know the percentage of moisture in it and its relation to temperature and how long you can store it. So right now in my basement here in uh, Solon, I have buckets of uh, grain from of to be planted this next spring. And of course, then some left over from uh, uh, from the fall stuff. I always save. I, I never plant everything. I always want to save some of my fall grains too, and I try to get them as absolutely dry as I can, down to like twelve percent or something like that before I put them away in a bucket. And now uh, Sylvia may have known about this too. I found that with the hold grains, the ones like emmer or einkorn or spelt that have a hole on them, they may seem like they're very dry. And I had an entire five gallon bucket of some spring spelt that I got from a contact in Denmark. And when I went to open it up in the, in the spring to plant it, it had all gotten moldy. So it seemed dry, but the hole itself is, is dry. So what I've done with the spelt that I have, I just keep it in a burlap bag and keep it hung up uh, somewhere. You know, so it, uh, it it isn't the moisture isn't trapped inside like a five gallon pail. Yeah, couple couple last questions. Um, how deep do you sow with your Planet Junior, with your Earthway, I should say? Oh, um, I would say about an inch or an inch and a half. It of course it depends on how well the seed bed is. Some of the stuff I've planted in still has you know uh, if someone makes some land available for me and I come along and they prepare it. 
I might find that it isn't really as uh, in as good a shape as as other places where it isn't as done as well as a garden would be. So I often have to come along and then I'll actually walk along afterwards if I can and 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 just walk up my rows and step them down in. Um, I found that wheat is pretty, uh, it's just, it's a grass, it's pretty forgiving. You know, it'll just, it's amazing how it will survive. And any recommended books for processing grain from harvest to finished product? Any oh, books see, that have a good, right like, how, 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 how do we do this? Yep. This is the great thing about having a virtual conference is if you've forgotten your book and you're at some place, you can't go to your shelf and grab it. But online, Amy Halloran can do that. has one called The New Bread Basket. That's Amy Halloran's book. Ellie Ragosa has one. This is called Restoring Heritage Grains, where, you know, she talks all about the grains she's worked on and things. And then, of course, there's Jack Laser's a uh, classic book, The Organic Grain Grower, which uh, uh, gives you all kinds of different ideas about things. Um, I wanted to say something about uh, when when I when I was growing on those small plots, even as much as like um, 16 by 25 feet, I might clip off all the heads and put them in paper bags. And then if I was sitting around in the evening, I could crunch them all up and and actually work on um, threshing them that way. And then I was able to save all the seeds. Uh, growing your own grain and enough to make bread is really kind of a labor of love. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Uh, if you don't have the machinery, uh, you know, to do it on any, uh, any kind of scale. So there's a lot of hand work. And if you could find one of those old fanning mills, that certainly helps in the final cleaning. Yeah. We got a couple of questions, then we, I know we got to wrap up and take a little break, but two questions, one from Benita uh, and also one from uh, Adrian about, firstly, do you put a cover crop in the walkways between varieties to suppress weeds? And um, how do you over sow the white clover um, to reduce? Is that something that's a broadcast or is that seeded in with the, with the, uh, the walk behind seeder? Yeah, I have found that uh, I'll, I will put some, of, some kind of cover crops. You saw some of those there. It looked like it was a uh, uh, cultivated with a rototiller in between the rows. I've done that on some of them. Now, I've, uh, now I mostly just use a weed whacker or I have a BCS tiller with a sickle bar in it. And I'll run that up between the rows and keep the, you know, uh, uh, the weeds in between down that way without having to disturb the soil. And what was the other one? Um, how do you put the white clover in with the grain? Oh, I just have one of those bags that cranks it out. And I actually do that uh, for, for my winter wheat. If I don't get a chance to get it in, I'll do it right in the spring and do it, you know, what they call that frost seeding. I'll go, I can get out as soon as I can kind of walk on it while it's still frozen, I'll do it. Or I'll, uh, I'll just plant right after I plant it. I don't have a way with, uh, with any of my seeders to, uh, to plant it uh, with the, uh, the seed drill. Okay. Well, everyone, let's hold our questions. And I would love to, if Richard or Sylvia, if you are interested in hearing more questions from folks with them connecting with you, please put your emails in the chat if possible. Um, but if that's okay, if not, or a mailing address. Um, we're going to take a short break, like a three minute break, um, just to get a drink of water. Uh, and then we're going to come back. So just stay on the Zoom. We're not going to, you don't have to like log back in. We're going to come back and hear um, from Benita and Paul all about sorghum. And we're so excited. And thank you all for your wonderful questions. So let's take a break. We'll come back at 1107 on the dot. Okay. Talk to you soon.
Okay, 11.07 on the dot, like we promised. Welcome back, everyone. I know that's a little quick. Big stretch. It's the morning. Get that blood flowing. Wake up, everybody, because there's some good knowledge, more good knowledge coming. Woo. Shake it off. All right. So here we are. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're really happy to be having this amazing conversation about sorghum which many of us don't did, haven't even known that is possible for us to grow in the north. Obviously, Sylvia in Vermont knows that. And Benita and Paul are going to share with us so much more about sorghum. And please take it away. And folks, put questions in the chat as we go through this. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. We may not get to them all. Um, and hopefully, Benita and Paul will be willing to be in contact with folks with more questions after the event. So if we go a little bit over today, like if we go to 12.05 and just giving folks a warning, we might go five minutes over, particularly if there's questions. So let's settle in and hear about sorghum. Welcome, Vanita and Paul. Thanks for having us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Am I, am I coming in clear today? Awesome. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I'm actually going to turn off my video to hopefully uh, support better uh, bandwidth. So do that now as well. So uh, Paul and I are here today to uh, celebrate uh, sorghum from Ujama family's point of view. I don't know so why. Some of you know about our little new company that started in response to, uh, to the need for um, food, sustainability, and communities of color. And uh, the truth is that um, Paul and I were out in a field one day. I call Paul my first uh, farmer. And uh, we were looking at um, a food forest that um, Paul had planted. Uh, and uh, we were talking about where we could go uh, with young people. And we felt that we needed to find a crop that would connect to them that they could find meaning in and they could find um, relatable. And so Sorghum jumped up at us. So my name is Benita Adib. I'm one of the co-founders of Ujama Farming uh, Collective and uh, Ujama Seeds, which is a BIPOC-led seed company that just launched its second catalog in January. So we thank so much for the support we've gotten from the industry and from all the wonderful people that we've gotten a chance to meet that have believed that um, uh, there was a place for us uh, within the landscape and have worked to help us uh, to find our place. So uh, we're standing on the shoulders of all you great seed savers uh, from history and from uh, today. And we thank you so much uh, for your willingness to work with us and accept us where, where we are. Um, and um, Paul, if you wanna just uh, talk a little bit, introduce yourself and let's talk about where we're gonna go with this. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll just myself, I'll jump back on the video. Um, Paul Lovelace or HP Lovelace, depending on who you're talking to. Um, I've been growing sorghum for a number of years, uh, and we'll talk more about our personal connections uh, to this particular crop. But um, it is a it is very exciting to be working with Ujama and particularly with um, sorghum, because it is a crop that has, as you're going to learn, so so many uses, and it, it excites the imagination of so many people in our community. So. I'm going to try to move on to the. And this is so, uh, as as many of you know that um, because of uh, incidents in history in the United States, uh, even though African people uh, came to this country with farming technology skills, uh, many of those skills have been lost due to a series of unfortunate historical events. And so um, communities have been separated from their traditional foods. Our work is how to reconnect people to their traditions and to and what could we do in order to really excite people about uh, relearning, reclaiming this lost heritage.
So our first crop uh, was sorghum. And sorghum is a, a story that as a part of a, a story we're telling about what we call uh, the African cousins. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them uh, later. But in order to reclaim that heritage, we've been talking about peas and okra, watermelon and gourd, but uh, sorghum was so important because of its ease in growing and um, the ability it has for these young folks. They see some young uh, people there in the slip slide that had never grown uh, uh, much of anything. It was something that they could grow easily. It had less requirements uh, uh, from the soil and it had the historical connection. Uh, it was also something that because it could grow all over the world, uh, we could find uh, connections to every community and every grower. <clears throat> I'm trying to switch slides, but for whatever reason, I'm just oh, it's not letting you switch slides. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'll get it in a second. There we go. So, yeah. what is sorghum, uh, botanically speaking? Uh, you know, the reason that I think it's so exciting is, you know, I can grow grass, you know, I, I can, uh, I can make that happen. And sorghum, you know, like corn is, is a grass, um, you know, the Posei family, it has um, loose flower heads and really deep roots. Um, it can withstand heat, it can withstand drought, it can handle saline soils, it can handle um, uh, calcareous soils or, you know, where there's uh, calcium carbonate in the ground, generally, uh, you know, these are sandy soils where there's lots of crushed up and decayed shells. Um, it can even withstand waterlogged soils. So it's one of those crops where I feel like I can't even mess it up. And it's resilient, you know, which is, and Benita said, you know, that's what makes it such a, a great traveler. It's also why it was particularly good to be growing with high school and college age kids. We started this with um, during COVID and we planted sorghum as a way to help people uh, believe that they could do something successfully. So many of the things that our, our, our previous presenters have talked about, we're gonna touch upon this, but the ease of use is uh, the ease of growing it and the, uh, the availability of it and the cultural uh, roots are, uh, equally as important. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit about uh, how sorghum, you know, it does originate in African savannas. It's like it's on wall paintings in Egypt in the seventh century, uh, you know, before Common Era. It's, uh, it's, it was carried along the Silk Road to the Middle East. And I think this is kind of interesting in that, you know, in the book of Ezekiel, you see the word uh, dukan, which is often translated as millet, but uh, in, in Arabic, that word continues to refer to uh, varieties of sorghum. And it continues to be a staple food in India, Africa, and China. Um, and so I think we're gonna, we're gonna move on to, uh, um, it's finding its way into Europe. And most likely it found its way into Europe from the Middle East. And maybe that's why the use of the word sorghum, um, which is actually maybe derived from Latin uh, sericum granum, which means Syrian grain. It finds its way into uh, to England, of course, and, and all the European countries. And then eventually it finds its way into the new world itself. I guess where in, in the possession of enslaved peoples and on the ships. Uh, for supplying grain. Nita, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I like to say that um, sorghum uh, was also something that was uh, on the table. It was in households uh, and uh, most families in the South, my family originated from North Carolina. Most families had this crop available and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, even though it, it, it uh, basically comes from the Horn of Africa, it has uh, found its way, you know, and varieties that can be grown in just about any climate worldwide. Uh, I was um, in a market in um, the Washington DC area and I ran across a woman uh, who was uh, from uh, Darfur, which is a region in Sudan that had been under extreme pressure 
Do you probably remember about the, the genocide from Darfur? And she asked me, had I ever heard of sorghum? And I said, well, yes, Ujamaa sells, um, you know, we have five or six varieties of sorghum. And she said, well, that can't be true because it's something that we thought we left behind that we would never see again. And so I pulled out uh, all the varieties to show her. And it turned out that one was actually from her hometown. It was Korjaj. So the idea that she had uh, been able to find something that uh, had the, was named after her town and was closely related to her culture and the tradition that she thought was lost was very exciting. So one of the most important things that uh, Ujama hopes to do is to help people find their culturally uh, important varieties and uh, learn how to adapt them and breed them to survive uh, in not just the climate we find ourselves in today, but in uh, the future uh, where we're going with climate change. That's lovely. And, and, and just uh, adding to that, I think that there is um, some resonance with the history that I'm excited about. And one of them is just consumer activism. And it became clear that uh, much like, much like uh, cotton, or, um, well, uh, sugar, uh, of course, was uh, deeply connected to slavery and forced, you know, slave labor. And so there's whole movements, the free produce movement of the 1780s, which are getting people to think about how their consumer choices affect, uh, you know, realities on the ground and, you know, and who they are. Uh, so, uh, you know, in your chat box, I hope you'll see there'll be a, a recipe for some anti-slavery gingerbread, uh, which could be made with sorghum. And so this goes on, you know, this, this movement continues on into the 1800s and is actually a major campaign within the Civil War to think about, you know, we don't want to be dependent upon, you know, Louisiana slave, you know, and plantations, sugar plantations, and the, the miserable conditions of, of these, you know, deadly mills. And, and so there was um, an incentive to think about, okay, what can we do? Because we're, you know, this is America where we eat a lot of sugar, we're dependent on sugar. Uh, how can we continue to um, continue to have sweet things in our lives without supporting slavery? And I think, you know, this uh, plant, I, this is great for you guys. You know, here we are, the north, the northern sugar plant. Here it is. It grows, you know, it grows in New York. It grows in Vermont. Um, and uh, it, you're able to, to produce sugar. And of course, this was used as a way to uh, basically uh, hurt hurt the economy of uh, Southern plantations and, and win the war. I would call it here, sweet resistance. Benita, you wanna to add to that? Yes, uh, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper uh, quoted, um, our moral influence against slavery must be weakened. Our testimony diluted if we are constantly demanding rice from the swamps, cotton from the plantation and sugar from the deadly mills. The average lifespan in uh, slave uh, in the sugar plantations was seven years for Africans. So um, it, uh, sorghum has played a very important role in history. And then of course, uh, you know, the, the war ends, but sorghum, sorghum doesn't end. And it continues to be grown in places where you simply can't grow sugar cane, including places like where we're from. Benita, this first picture is your community, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so my family uh, is from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, my mother uh, was a graduate of Orange County Training School, which is what high schools were called back in that day. Um, and it was amazing for us to find that sorghum um, growing was an important crop and this, the farmers in this region uh, were very successful. It was a, a very uh, prosperous thing to do. This farmer, uh, his name was uh, Wes Chris, uh, had a, a portable sorghum mill that he took from farm to farm. He uh, processed uh, sorghum uh, uh, syrup for the local farmer and took one gallon uh, out of six that he processed. So um, my family is deeply uh, working on learning more about uh, West Chris and other um, sorghum producers in this area, but it, it was very exciting to find out that it was right there uh, in my uh, 
family home. And this uh, handsome gentleman on the right of your screen is uh, Homer, uh, uh, Homer Lovelace, my, my grandfather, 1934, uh, doing the same thing that I'm continuing to do with a mill that looks very similar. Uh, the only difference is his is likely powered by mules and ours is people powered. We'll, we'll get more into that uh, momentarily. So let me see. This is sort of a, a now and then slide. Uh, we stayed with the sort of film noir thing for ourselves. But, uh, you know, this is us uh, to the right. You can see Benita kind of uh, smiling over there in the far corner. There's Nate Kleiman from the Environmental uh, Farming Network. And, and one of our, this was our first uh, sorghum festival where we're processing the juice into uh, uh, sorghum syrup. It was such a nostalgic experience because there we were, it was after dark, you know, we were in a shed cooking sorghum and the smell of this uh, delicious uh, juice, you can smell for, you know, a half a mile. And it, it just felt like a happy and a sacred and a historical uh, place to be. But we were actually producing sorghum and, uh, you know, we hope to, um, develop this project. We'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing with Sergum as we go on. There's Wes Chris's portable mill. Uh, this is our portable mill. We call it the uh, Sweet Chariot over here to the right. And we've been uh, taking it to festivals. We take it to schools. And um, and because you know you're aware of some of the history now, you can imagine how this type of of work in this festival environment could be integrated into curriculum. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, some of the exciting work that we're doing relates to this little piece of equipment that we picked up not too long ago. Yeah, and ours is a one mule um, sorghum mill. Um, our dear friend Nate Kyman has a two horse mill. That one is really uh, very large. So when we think about this work, George Washington Carver is really the father of uh, this kind of thinking, this kind of uh, work. And we believe that we are standing on the shoulders of George Washington Carver. What he was able to do was, uh, he was able to come up with multiple uses uh, and varieties of crops. And we believe that um, uh, we can continue his legacy by bringing sorghum forward as he did with, um, with uh, soy and peanuts and sweet potato, we plan to do that with sorghum. This is this is a little something. Uh, one of the many things I just stole off the internet, which uh, shows you how different parts of the sorghum plant are, you know, can be used for different functions, from the grains to the stalks, and so forth. Just all, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in detail. So I just thought I'd give you a visual of it, and then we shall proceed. I can. There we go. Oh yeah, my favorite. So uh, people are very excited about sorghum syrup, and you know, uh, but what I what I love more than anything else is just the juice. I could drink sorghum juice all day long. I like to carbonate it. I like to put a little, uh, you know, uh, sumac in it to give it a little bit of a lemon flavor. Uh, we're starting the process of um, uh, bottling. Uh, this upcoming year, um, working with different restaurants and maybe even selling through JAMA um, Cooperative Farming Alliance website. Very exciting. But if you haven't tasted sorghum juice, I really recommend uh, giving that a try. Everyone's, a lot of people have tasted the syrup, but not everybody has tasted this amazing, delicious, and even healthy drink. You know, I think it's very interesting you see this jar to the left. That uh, is a very common vessel. It's a gourd, and it's filled with a uh, traditional drink that's sold by women um, throughout the continent. There's recipes of beer from all over uh, Africa, as there are, I'm sure, other places. But beer is a crop that uh, women uh, were able, are able to sell. And uh, it's a way in which some of the financial resources of the family make it back into the pockets of women. Uh, this beer uh, is part of ceremony and is traditionally used uh, for many types of ceremony. It's becoming a use for ceremony for us too. At the end of a week, 
you know, people like a nice cold beer. So we have growers that are working on several recipes. One of our growers has started a beer garden and he is using uh, several different recipes. Only 1% of uh, beer producers, uh, breweries in the United States are African-Americans, but he's hoping to uh, introduce these varieties uh, to give um, uh, a cultural connection to uh, customers as we go on. And I should just give a shout out to uh, my Muslim friends who are also trying to make non-alcoholic versions of these beers and alcohols as well. Or at least not alcohols, but. Um, <laughs> recently, um, a grower came to us with the a request for sorghum variety to use in the homemade uh, moonshine kit. And we've also uh, recently been approached by a, a brewer uh, who was not able to source sorghum. So the idea that we can provide uh, uh, that for him to increase revenues uh, for our growers, anything we can do to help our growers, uh, most African-American growers and small scale growers are working full-time jobs in order to support their farms. So uh, this is a way for us to increase the revenue streams and hopefully um, make those farms uh, more sustainable. And the thing you're seeing to you in, on your screen, that's a lot of different types of sorghum seed that's being processed into making a, a, a liquor in, in China that's absolutely, you know, completely famous. Uh, I don't remember the name of it right now, but I, oh yeah, uh, Mao Tai is the name of it. Anyway, proceed. Uh, another one of our growers has focused in on the breakfast use. It's something uh, that is a commonly eaten breakfast in West Africa uh, that's really delicious and high in nutrient, nu nutrient dense. It's also something that has brought uh, the Center for Human Nutrition uh, to work with us, uh, USDA and ARS. Their division is looking at what they call fortified food, and they believe that sorghum better known as the great millet, is one of the most important foods that they hope to see uh, brought back into um, a more popular use in the, in the country. They believe it acts as a fortified food. Uh, and they uh, observed that people who lived in regions that ate these kinds of fortified foods had less access to uh, the vaccine, but had the lowest, some of the lowest rates in the world for getting COVID. So they're now looking at how the human body interacts with the, the, the values that are coming out of this variety. Uh, also, because we have so many people in our community that are um, um, intolerant, milk, intolerant uh, of milk, uh, look at the beautiful uh, milk that can be um, uh, created uh, from the green sorghum uh, seeds. So we hope that we can fill many uh, interests. Our individual growers are designing, uh, are, are studying different uses. And we hope to have, um, well, we already have a working group now that's looking at all the different things that can be done uh, with sorghum. And there'll be ex experts within the uh, Ujama community that uh, can bring uh, more light to uses and uh, expertise to this discussion of these foods. And hopefully you'll, you'll be able to see the sorghum milk recipe in the chat box, as well as the uh, Somali sorghum porridge in the chat box as well. And uh, proceed. This is one of our uh, um, most exciting things that's happening right now is, uh, is the use of these green grains. I guess you'd say that, uh, you know, there would be in there, uh, Sort of a um, hard dough stage, or you know, it's still green. Uh, and um, you take the green heads or the panicles, and oftentimes they're either boiled or they're sometimes they're put in you know the ash of a fire, and they can be used. I put in a picture of these fritters and included a fritter recipe, hopefully in the chat box. But um, you know, so like for us, if you're if you're trying to grow sorghum for the cane to make the juice. You know, you can take these heads, the panicles off early and be eating this delicious, um, truly delicious and nutty flavored uh, you know, delicacy. Uh, punk is a, an Indian word, but I know that there's, uh, you know, many uh, 
many different uh, versions of this that's being eaten in Africa and, and China as well. And now, of course, you know, we're excited to eat it too. It's delicious. And popping sorghum, uh, you can see here, the middle picture shows you there are many different types of seeds that you can pop and there they are, uh, you know, that's what they look like. This other little picture I took yesterday in my kitchen, just as it was starting to pop and they are so sweet. These little, these little tiny uh, popcorn, they're smaller than a dime um, and uh, pretty yummy. We put it on top of soup, you know, sort of a garnish. It's, it's not, you know, it's not, it, we're not watching our films with this particular corn, but you know, we're still, still making it happen. Sorry, this is my attempt at a joke of math, but seed plus the mill equals the flour and then some sort of uh, calculus brings the bread um, and there'll be more on that. We're, we're, we're pretty excited about it. Um, one thing you should know about sorghum flour is it oftentimes has a little bit of a, a sour flavor to it, which is why a lot of people mix it up. But, you know, Sylvia, I feel like you're really the expert when it comes to the bread on this uh, team. So if you ever if you want to weigh in at some point on the bread, please, uh, you're invited to, to do so. In Ethiopia and uh, in Eritrea, it's often uh, turned into a, uh, a fermented uh, a process by which they make injera. If you ever had injera, which is uh, unleavened bread that has a, a sourdough flavor, it's very nutritious. It's used all over the horn as um, as uh, the the base in which uh, vegetables and other things are added on top. And it's used almost like a spoon in which you pick up your food using this. So that is another um, use uh, for sorghum that I hope to uh, master in the next year. A uh, mushroom spawn completely explained. For those of you who try to produce your own mushrooms, um, sorghum is, is commonly used by commercial growers. Uh, you've got to sterilize the grains and um, that thing. You got to sterilize the grains and, and inoculate them with the uh, mushroom culture or, or, you know, mycelium. And once it's inoculated, I mean, there's, it's, a, I got a whole process here, step by step, should be in the chat box on, on how to do it, but it's fairly simple. It can be done at home. So we've um, recently met a grower, uh, a mushroom producer in uh, New Jersey. And so we're talking about how we could partner in order to bring more uh, mushroom production uh, into home use. And also uh, for uh, growers who wanna have a steady crop of mushroom that they can grow uh, in, um, in a succession manner. So every week you can show up at the um, farmer's market with mushrooms and we're hoping to integrate the two products um, because of their uh, symbiotic relationship. Obvious, this one's uh, pretty obvious, uh, but when we've been growing, uh, we've been taking a lot of the seed heads off and feeding them to our chickens. Um, some people say that the um, grains have are, are high in uh, tannins. Um, our chickens are devouring them. So I don't know that if we have a more of a low tannin variety that we're growing, we've been growing uh, Della. Um, uh, so it's a sweet sorghum variety, but uh, we are also um, experimenting with different varieties that might have lower tannins. And I think it's also interesting to think about how tannins are likely something that exists because uh, people were trying to grow grains that the birds weren't devouring. You know, I, I know that my experience with growing grains has been one of keeping birds at day. I have not had that problem with sorghum. Um, so also, you know, here, yeah, cows eating a forage crop. This uh, bottom picture to your, um, to your left is the bagasse. Now, bagasse is uh, basically once you put the sorghum through the sorghum mill and it's crushed the juice, you have this, uh, this remaining material which can be fed to cattle. And of course the leaves are often uh, pulled off the plant, even while they're, you know, once it's reached the, a certain height, you can pull off the leaves and feed them to goats and cows and, and everything else. Um, but I've been uh, in the chat box, uh, there's an article about uh, low tannin sorghum for poultry feed, which uh, we're pretty interested in right now as well. And on the, the perennial sorghum front, it's very exciting. Um, 
I know the Land Institute is, is working on some of these things. Also, our friends at the Environmental Farm Network and Ujamaa is also going to be selling some perennial sorghum. That's pretty exciting. Um, what, what basically what it is, is there are some tropical there are some tropical perennial sorghums uh, that have been hybridized by some brilliant uh, by some brilliant farmers uh, with the um, cold hardy perennial Johnson grass uh, and. Yeah, and so in the, I basically linked to um, uh, EFN's work with this. So we were successfully able to produce a sorghum um, perennial crop uh, at uh, the seed farm, one of our partners uh, from Princeton University. We have a, a small plot that eventually will hopefully grow. And uh, we were able to harvest this uh, just this week. It was very exciting. We have... Um, interns that are working with us uh, that are not agricultural majors, but have learned to love the work and feel that this work has a certain level of a sacredness because of its honor uh, for history, but also because it's, uh, its prospects for future development. So we hope to bring you sorghum, uh, perennial sorghum as maybe a solution to uh, uh, multiple uh, challenges we face in this industry. Uh, food and fabric dye. It's it's very exciting. Uh, we you know we have folks who are using the leaves for dye, using the seeds for dye, and as you can see, this top picture. Uh, generally, I see that uh, when I when I see sorghum cane looking like that, it's after a really hard freeze. <laughs> I see that the sorghum basically goes this bright this to this bright red pigment, and um, it's used as a colorant in, in processing foods. You can make. Um, you can basically get a, um, you know, just call that like a, we call the essence of something, um, like an extract, and uh, you can be dyeing fabrics as well. And you, Benita, we have some folks who are doing that, don't we? So the first uh, project that was brought to us by the community was called uh, uh, Dyes, Fibers, and Food. And it were students uh, and professors uh, involved with the American Crafting Association and local uh, a local school of the arts, Maryland School for the Arts, that had uh, their students learning to extract uh, dyes from these uh, various natural sources and produce a full range of dyes. And what we found out was that it really was a perfect project for us. It was doing sorghum. So what we sought to do was to, um, to uh, work to build a, a coalition between local farmers and local crafters in order to supply uh, crops for their work. They were very much concerned with the idea that there's so many synthetic dyes that are used in, in the fashion industry. There is a movement uh, called the uh, Sustainable Fashion that seeks to move toward using uh, uh, natural dyes and fibers. And so uh, this movement is underway. Um, there are dye gardens uh, popping up in the Baltimore area near that university. And we found about nine varieties uh, that we're experimenting around and hopefully we can find a way to make those available. Also those red leaves are sold in packages in uh, stores that supply uh, uh, food to African um, uh, communities. And the, the leaves are used as a food additive, as a food coloring, uh, particularly for rice dishes. But um, it is believed that uh, the nutrient value uh, comes along with the beautiful color that it provides to food. And I also understand it has good fastness properties, which is what a lot of people who are using dyes want to know. Um, and then it, the the paper, uh, it's very exciting because we have all this uh, um, leftover. What you're seeing now is like this is a uh, this is um, sorghum that's been put through a press. And that's the bagasse, um, and you know you can see it's very fibrous. And so figuring out how to convert that into paper in the chat box, there'll be a paper making recipe. This is exciting in part because uh, the broom that you're looking at on the top and bottom uh, was uh, pictures given to us by Sylvia. She's made these brooms. Um, and so, go ahead. Yeah, so um, 
you know, you might have heard about jumping the broom, which was a, a, a tradition uh, because enslaved people were not allowed to legally marry. They went to ceremony, which is what Africans do anyway. And the ceremony involved jumping the broom. And so it's, it's very exciting to see these beautiful brooms that, um, that are, have, are utility, but also are ceremonial and cultural and uh, symbolize you know, the future of a happy and wonderful marriage. So uh, thank you very much, Sylvia, for um, your contribution to, to this work or, and study around broom corn. And yeah, these are broom corn varieties. And 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 Sylvia, you correct me if I'm wrong, but is this the is this the dwarf mayo that you were talking about before? I I guess uh, it may be, but um, yeah. So let's let's proceed. Oh, living classrooms. Okay, so um, uh, Bonita and I um, are both deeply invested in the. Uh, K through college community in creating spaces, physical spaces. And my, my job, actually, my 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 paying gig for the most part is I um, run an organization called Teach Outside. And one of the things that we do are create outdoor spaces. You know, using uh, using you know uh, living uh, physical green spaces and barriers, sound barriers, um, heat traps, all these different things. Um, and also because you know we've been talking about the history of sorghum and the, and the potential of sorghum uh, is integrating all of that within curriculum. It's fascinating and um, we, bringing the sorghum mill there and having festivals with the students as well. In the right, you're seeing my little daughter um, Anisa Sage Grady Lovelace standing in a little patch of sorghum, and it's with okra and there's field peas in there too. You want to talk about some African cousins, Bonita? Yeah, so what, um, you know, what's commonly known are the three sisters. Uh, of course, they don't include pepper and tomatoes and potatoes in that normally. But um, we thought that that would be a good way for people to understand the relationship between these African varieties. So you can see that um, uh, Paul is tre trellising uh, peas uh, uh, into the sorghum. It grows very tall. It's a beautiful plant that be used uh, in many ways. But what we hope to do is to help people understand the relationship between these plants. So we are uh, using um, corn, uh, we're using sorghum and okra in the same way that Three Sisters uh, uses uh, sunflowers and corn. And the concept is to, sh to help people begin to see the connectedness between these crops. And uh, also as we can organize them in a way that uh, will help children to remember them and to identify them, to value them and to take them home and be able to uh, teach uh, about these uh, heritage varieties to their families. And it's absolutely true in terms of seed and weed suppression when you're growing a lot of these crops, especially ground covering crops um, like uh, uh, peas will vine, but they'll also, you know, will cover the ground as well. It takes care of a lot of the weeds that you'd be dealing with otherwise. Not that I've had too much trouble with uh, with weeds with the sorghum, but it is still something to consider. I think it becomes a problem when you go to larger scale production. That's something, you know, we would like to uh, throw out to you. Uh, some of our growers who are growing more than an acre who would like to use their combines are talking about challenges that they have. And I'll talk about that in the future. I just want to say that these crops work beautifully in what we're calling edible classrooms, edible schoolyards. And so we're really looking at integrating this study into uh, everyday curriculum, not something that kids have to go to, to uh, ag school to learn, uh, but will be learning uh, as they should be in kindergarten. That's the whole concept of kindergarten is the first thing that you should learn is about how to feed yourself and about the natural world. So we're trying to uh, reinvigorate the concept of uh, early childhood learning or kindergarten learning. So uh, let's talk about biofuels. <laughs> so uh, Several of our growers are looking at production, uh, looking at various um, 
uh, varieties of seed which can produce the most uh, biofuel, the most oil seed. And, you know, there's a lot of issues to consider, especially when this is a major food crop around the world. And so I think we need to think about the balance between food crop and be aware of, you know, what's happened with corn uh, is a good example, you know, of competing interests between um, fuel and the, the issues of uh, human nutrition. So uh, we're thinking about this. We're hoping to engage all of you in a discussion about how do we maintain the balance to make sure that people have what they need to have a healthy life and we can reduce our, our carbon footprint. Which brings us to regenerative agriculture. Uh, many people are using sorghum to sequester carbon and restore uh, you know, climate balance, uh, basically pulling, pulling the carbon dioxide out of the air and, and, and putting carbon back in the soil. Um, we're we're uh, very excited about this potential and and, and uh, you know thinking about how we're in the soil, but we're also thinking about how we're healing ourselves and our communities. And so, in this picture, you know, when we talk about regenerative ag agriculture, we're not just talking about um, regenerating the soil. Uh, we're actually talking about regenerating community and physical activity that's productive. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot is. You know, when people are going to the gym, they, they could just as easily be uh, out with us on the farm, stretching, working, using muscles they didn't know they even had. Benita, do you want to add to that? Yeah, we work with um, Walk Maryland um, uh, for their initiative. We found that a certain number of minutes, 30 minutes of working in the garden was equal to walking, uh, you know, a mile or so. So what we're trying to say is you can do all these things at the same time. You can um, do something that feeds your family, that saves money, that provides you, uh, you know, with the sunshine, the sunlight you need and the vitamins uh, that you need, and also uh, be doing something uh, that uh, makes you stronger and more fit. Uh, we had a, um, an aunt uh, in uh, West Africa who was farming uh, when she was uh, 109 years old, still going to the farm every day. So I think that uh, this work, if we do it right, can help to uh, extend our lives, make us happier, happier and healthier. So how do you do, how do you grow this stuff, right? Um, it's probably a question that uh, many of you have been asking. So what we do, uh, what, what, and we've learned the hard way, sometimes less is more because you got a jar like this. You think I got to plan all this stuff. And next thing you know, you've got an acre of sorghum and like four people trying to st st staring at a stand that can never be, can or never even be 25 people <laughs> yeah, or yeah, with machines. Uh, but what we do, and, and I also, we have, uh, we've had very good success uh, with the uh, vitality and the germination rates of our seeds. Like crazy like every like every seed that we're planting is growing so i had started planting or sowing the seeds about a half inch deep and then putting them four inches apart with the idea that i would be you know thinning to eight inches i quit doing that and now i'm planting at eight inches and then just going back and in terms of uh when to plant i think that this is what this is what what's most important is that Sorghum is not going to take off when the temperatures are cold, like below 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So we plant, um, even in, um, in Kentucky, we're planting in, you know, late May, early June, same in Maryland. I would think, you know, wait as long as you can. You, you want to be able to, to harvest, you know, before, um, you know, major frosts set in. So if you're growing in, in New York, Vermont, I would think, you know, late May is when you want to hit it. Uh, just to be about right. And uh, in terms of how much to grow, it really depends on what your what your goal is. Um, for us, you know, we're trying to produce, uh, you know, syrup. So um, basically, uh, if we have two 50 foot rows, uh, we're going to get two thirds gallon of syrup. Um, which would be like six gallons of juice. For me, it's very hard to make syrup when I have to give up all that juice. 
you know, I love I and I love it. I love it on so oatmeal. Delicious. I love it on biscuits, but I am just so thirsty when that stuff is getting pressed. It's unbelievable. And I love to share the wealth and it's just like so much bounty. Um, and I probably want to just take questions on the on the growing side as as they come, because I don't want to I don't want to um, belabor it. But I think the most important thing I'd like to say about uh, growing sorghum, and this is not to the experienced grower like many of you are, but to the novice, just get started. Get some um, in the ground. You can start in flats and then move it out to the field. I think the big secret is don't wait another year. Do it this year, do it now, and learn as you go. Look at that big monstrous stand of sorghum behind us there. Um, we grew so much that first year. Um, we fed so many birds uh, seeds, but <laughs> uh, chickens too, you know, because we and we try as much of it as possible. I will say that, you know, uh, the work that we have been doing has been uh, very uh, low tech. We've been seeding uh, by hand. We've been harvesting with scythes. Um, we come in, we're stripping the leaves by hand, uh, and, and then we're running it through the mill using, you know, human power. Basically, as you can see here, the reason that that's uh, turning is people uh, are one person on each side are pushing the gears around to to make it go and squeeze out that juice. Um, and this slide, last one is is the sorghum calls for collaboration and. One of the reasons that it calls for collaboration is because you know, you've got this, you've got this crop that has so many uses, and most likely you're focused because of your time and your you know your capacity. You're focused on you know one end use. That's why you got to have friends who are interested in feeding their chickens, who are interested in making the dyes, who are interested in the experiments. Uh, and, 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 and it really does just, you know, I grew up in a community uh, in Kentucky where there was a sorghum festival every year. My family grew sorghum. We also grew tobacco and it was supplementary income. Uh, but more than that is a time when people come together with common cause to celebrate a harvest and, you know, the, the sweetness of life. And Bonita, you want to talk a little bit more about this collaboration opportunities. Yeah, we've been doing uh, sorghum festivals uh, from the deepest part of uh, of COVID because uh, agricultural activity was allowed by the governor. <laughs> we could get together to harvest, and it's the basis. Uh, it's the the building block for us. There's uh, we always get asked the question, you know, how can you uh, work with Ujama? How can you get involved? We have actually three ways you can do that. One is to simply save seeds. Uh, so you're uh, available, you can get seeds from ujamaseeds.com, or you can get these seeds. Many people have talked about seed savers and other sources, but just learn how to save seeds. Get some in the ground and try them. The second way you could get involved is to become a steward. So a steward is a person who's an experienced seed saver or ex an experienced farmer who can take on the responsibility of a, doing an extension on a very rare variety that we need to bring into cultivation. And so then in addition, we have our collaborative partners. Uh, we collaborate with many organizations uh, uh, in your area, it would be Soul Fire Farm, it would be Akakeek Foundation, um, this is Serenity Farm in Maryland, uh, University of Kentucky, Princeton University. And what they do is uh, they're working with us uh, because they have the infrastructure and they have the willing bodies, you know, all the amazing youth and the expertise from the staff to work on uh, perennial varieties and to do specialized varieties. We ask that every partner, however, open up what they're learning to the surrounding communities, particularly the underserved and disadvantaged farmers and to communities that have not had this experience. We ask them to open up their doors to share and to teach and to learn from uh, communities. So um, I think that's about the end of our presentation. Uh, if there's any more questions, I think we got a, a couple of more minutes. Well, ironically, I'll stop sharing. So <laughs> there. <laughs> no, that was amazing. And there are some questions in the chat. And um, I posted all those links uh, in the chats for folks definitely <laughs> as the the soon to be uh, popular selling t-shirt save the chat uh, 
you'll get yours, I'm sure. But yeah, let's let's paw back through some of the questions. There's definitely lots of them. Um, and we'll start with Joy's questions. Um, do you do you have a recipe for sorghum syrups? Maybe this is a book or something that should go in the chat. Uh, and then a question about animals. Um, you know, uh, liking or being damaging the um, sorghum, uh, raccoons, groundhogs, deer. What do you see in terms of pressure? Uh, very and little, uh, very little yeah, pressure. You want me to pressure. let you go through? Yeah, let me let me finish the last question of Joyce. It says, "Is it possible <laughs> to grow as far south as Florida?" That's her last question. Now go ahead. Yep. Sorghum grows all over the world. You know, it comes from the horn, so trust me, it can do great in Florida. And there's many varieties. So yes, you can grow it everywhere from Ukraine, you know, uh, from China, Northern China. Yes, there's some variety you can grow. In terms of the deer pressure, I agree. There's been very little animal uh, pressure. You know, we're always surprised when we come and there's still a, a field full of grain. The birds haven't even eaten it all. It's so productive. Our germination rates have been amazing, particularly on the, the sweet sorghums with um, you know, rates like 96 to 99% in terms of our germination rates. Is uh, You probably uh, remember that in East Africa, the, the uh, maize crop failed. They were able to get a sorghum crop in the ground and save uh, themselves from hunger. People were dancing all over uh, East Africa and Southern Africa because sorghum, which was a historic grain for them, that they had moved away thinking that the answer must be somewhere else. And they came back to sorghum and people are now looking at ancient grains a lot more uh, seriously. Um, did I hit that? Yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah. Let, let me uh, let me address the uh, one of the things in the chat box is from the Mountain Farm Museum sorghum mill, and they go into a little bit about how to make the uh, how to make the syrup. But I will tell you that even prior to having a sorghum mill, that didn't stop that didn't stop uh, that didn't stop me. Uh, I grew uh, I grew it in Boston when I was in school up there. I, I I've I grew it in Virginia, I grew it in Kentucky, I grew it in, in Maryland. And, and what oftentimes what I would do is peel off the harder outer layer of the cane and cut it into small pieces. And then I would use a juicer to get the, just like a regular juicer to get the juice. And then from there, I was cooking on top of my stove. Now people can tell me that I have sticky, that I have a sticky ceiling or, or whatever else, but um, it worked. It worked, and 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 if you if you look at the uh, the Mountain Farm Museum sorghum mill, they'll tell you like what to what it kind of looks like or what it sounds like when it's about right. Um, you can't overcook it. Now, this is like many things well, that actually it it it, it is an tried. art. <laughs> you know, some people will tell you that you know, it's it's about the specific temperature, um, but I've seen I've seen uh, I've seen people fail when, when they're when they think they're doing everything right. Um, it's something that you learn to do through the process of doing. I suspect uh, that there are. I suspect it's a lot like maple syrup making in the sense that yeah. the, the it's vessel, that hard, the, the soft boil, hard boil yeah. thing is what you have to and, look for. Yeah, uh, and that vessel I, that you're doing it in. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah, please do not wait. Uh, take that cane. If you got anything to break it with, break it, put in a pot of water and let it boil. So you can, on your kitchen, you can uh, create that. Understanding that as it gets darker, as you boil it, that will show you the, the level of thickness. If you want it for a syrup that you're going to pour in your pancakes, then you want it to be, you know, light. If you want it to be a replacement for that black strap molasses, then you're going to want to take it all the way dark. And then you can can it as you would um, re using regular canning strategies. Um, make sure you follow those guidelines that you would normally do. Put it in a pot, boil it, you know, with a, um, a lid. And uh, you'll have sorghum all year. So we got a question about whether this can be grown in small plots, you know, for community gardens. Is there a population, you know, size that's required for, you know, to save seed from or any of those things? So what is the what's a good educational or school garden plot that you've been successful with? We've been working with plots that are about uh, three feet deep. So yes. um, ostensibly, you know, three rows. I use it as a privacy fence. I got a, a 
around my, my, I have a little urban farm in Maryland and we basically block out the world with sorghum for certain parts of the year. It doesn't take much to get a seed crop. If you're trying to get seeds, you know, if you had three plants, you're going to produce enough seed to, to, you know, to do anything you want to do. Um, if you're trying to, if you're trying to make, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of syrup or a lot of juice, you know, you, you, you might want 50 feet. But you, you know, any small amounts work. If you're if you're just for home use, it doesn't take that much, mm. honestly. I've seen twenty and twenty five plants. Uh, I think uh, what you need to do is get started. So if that's what it takes, a small plot. Even I think uh, Sylvia talked about a three by six. If you used a block, you know that might work out well for you as well because then you could uh, um, judge and see for yourself. The most important thing is don't wait. Do it now. Do it this year. Love that. And the, you you piqued people's interest about the sorghum kernels and eating popcorn, eating pop sorghum. Is there a company that does that? Is there anyone who's making or sells uh, sorghum to be popped, or is there or that pop should be sorghum? us? That should be Ujama. That's where we're going. Look forward to uh, getting it from us as a value added <laughs> uh, product. That said, I will say that the picture I showed you, I was uh, popping some of like, what is it called? Bob's Red Meal. Uh, you know, it's, it's a white, it's a white sorghum. And it's actually, you can buy sorghum that's sold as popping sorghum oftentimes. But like I was trying to point out, um, sorghum is funny because it, it does have so many uses. Uh, oftentimes people will try to grow, you know, this seed is for popping. This seed is for juice. This seed is for... Um, but I find that they have, uh, they're multifunctional, that one type of plant can, you can pop the corn, you can make the juice, you can make paper, you can make, you can dye things with it. Um, and, and, uh, you know, we're, we're excited about varieties that do the most. It's funny, it's a, sort of the opposite approach of what we think of as a modern breeding, where we're going to find the best traits that do one thing, mm -hmm. rather than what is more of a quantum perspective about growing a crop is let's have a crop that's good at all the things. So it's that's like right. our modern breed breeding would be, let's look for, you know, qualitative traits that we can measure that do this and create this whatever. And that's how we end up with varieties that are dependent on fertilizers and pesticides is varieties. Um, can that I say that, um, that yep. some of the products that are on the market now are, are made with the animal feed sorghum? the forage sorghum and it's not yummy it doesn't taste good so mm -hmm. go back to the ancient sorghums go back to the old grains excellent well we're we're at our sort of stopping point but would love to hear one last word from paul and you know paul and benita if there's anything you want to, people to take away with from this and if you'd like to put no pressure but contact information in the chat so people can reach out to you with more questions that'd be great Last words? Grow food. <laughs> Sorghum is delicious. <laughs> it is. Everyone should, yeah, it makes everyone good should grow it. It moonshine, too. I, I, okay. Okay. Well, good. Uh, sounds like we're doing it. And I really appreciate everybody here. And really appreciate everyone's attention. I know it's been a really... Uh, information-packed morning with all four of our speakers. Uh, and I'm really excited to be start adding grains into my seed operation as well. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end here. A reminder that we have a wonderful exploration of polenta as a gateway to understanding food traditions and seed traditions coming up at 2 p.m. And then this evening starting at 6 p.m., we have kind of a open mic slash dinner event Love to have you folks if you want to attend or share in that event also. So take care. Have a wonderful lunch. We'll see you back in the seed, uh, the seed sessions at 2 p.m. Okay, everyone. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks for having us.